A Los Angeles hotel is being targeted by protesters for hosting a fundraiser supporting the Israel military forces. The fundraiser is held each year. Protesters say they're upset that the event is being held just weeks after the onslaught of Gaza civilians and days after new illegal settlement announcements in the West Bank. Protesters say the event raises tens of millions of dollars for the Israeli military fund. They say this is an addition to the billions of dollars given to Israel each year by United States taxpayers. There is a feast of cowards inside the hotel. Shaquille Saeed is with the U.S. campaign to end Israeli occupation. Saeed says the protest is meant to condemn the Israeli war machine and the people who support it. He says that he's encouraged that more people appear to be paying attention to the truth about Israel. Organizers of the fundraiser say the event helps to raise money for those serving in the military and for fallen soldiers. But protesters say they know where the money really goes and how it's being used. We know what they do with that. They've committed heinous war crimes. They're conducting a campaign of genocidal elimination, really, of the Palestinian life and, and lives and, and culture. They've been condemned as much by the UN and by most civilized countries. Alfred Lambermont Weber, who, who is a, a war crimes lawyer who's joining us now via Skype from Vancouver. Uh, Mr. Weber, thanks a lot for joining us. And I wanted to ask you firstly, um, uh, is Israel correct when it says that this, this vote is a meaningless mechanical vote? Well, no. Uh, it, in fact, it is Israel that is losing its credibility under international law. Because if we go back... It was Iran and Egypt that first proposed the Middle East nuclear free zone in 1974. And this is an ongoing treaty effort that is part of eight nuclear free zones around the world. And there was to have been on December 15th in uh, Helsinki an ongoing treaty, which is a direct line from the proposal by Iran and Egypt from 1974 forward. Uh, uh, to carry forward this effort, and so that the UN vote uh, uh, 174 to 6 goes back to 1974. So it's a perfectly logical vote that has a long logistics in it, and that is part of eight nuclear free zone treaties worldwide. Iran's, excuse me, Israel's response is part of a policy that they adopted that's called studied ambiguity. They call it amimut, studied ambiguity, which means they're trying to fake out the world. But the problem is that they're running up against international law now, and they cannot fake out the world because the people who voted, there were only six votes against this resolution, Israel, the United States, and Canada, Canada has gone into the pocket of Israel, and then Micronesia, Palau, and one other state. These are Pacific states that the United States bombed with hydrogen bombs during H-bomb testing. They are, they are states that have been decimated by H-bomb testing. So there's an enormous irony there. And, and what, one can only hope now that, that, the, that the force of international law here, of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, of the IAEA, of, of the Middle East Nuclear Free Zone, which was first proposed in 1974 by Iran and by Egypt. So we're talking about something that has almost 40 years going forward that, 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 that these successive votes by overwhelming majorities. Operation Pillar of Cloud that Israel has carried out in Gaza is over now. Both Israel and Hamas are claiming victory. Who do you think is the winner? I don't think Israel is the winner you know, of public opinion internationally in the region. It lost heavily. Uh, nobody likes to see uh, advanced military aircraft bombing civilian pop to attack others, especially civilians. The fact that one side commits occasional acts of terrorism does not justify state terrorism. Hamas is an organization that doesn't have much of a military capacity. Um, many people actually say that Israel, back in 2008-2009, um, and also this time, 
if it really wanted to, could have squeezed Hamas out of Palestine, but it didn't do so. Why? Well, I think Israel did attempt very in, to use uh, violence um, in the earlier cast lead operation. It did, that was at the uh, very end of 2008, uh, as uh, there was a change of administrations going on in Washington. It's interesting, this war also happened well, around the U.S. election time. Exactly. But, do you think but Israel failed. Um, and uh, the reason it failed is that the strategy is wrong. Uh, you cannot bomb people into peaceful coexistence. It just does not work. Well, I suspect that the timing in this case was dictated by the Israeli election. Uh, it's very popular in Israel to kill lots of Palestinians in Gaza. Uh, and Hamas is seen as a monster. And so uh, a war against Hamas wins votes. The wording of the Operation Pillar of Cloud, obviously referring to the Bible and back in the Bible, um, it was the pillar of cloud who let the Israelis through out of Egypt and saved them from the Pharaoh. How much does the Torah narrative actually dominate the mindset of Israeli war planners? Well, the religious element uh, in both in the Israeli armed forces, uh, largely settler driven, um, not Orthodox Jews, many of whom don't want to serve in the military, refuse to do so. But the religious complexion of the Israeli defense forces is uh, steadily increased. Uh, so uh, religion is now very much bound up with uh, its operations. Uh, the language of some rabbis during cast lead was uh, simply hair-raising in terms of evoking Old Testament images of genocide against uh, non-Jews. Um, I think also it's true that uh, this use of language reflects the fact that the Israeli-Palestinian struggle, which began as a sort of struggle between to competing nationalisms mm -hmm. and became a struggle between Arabs and Israelis has now become a struggle between Jews and Muslims. In the Western media, though, the operation Pillar of Cloud was renamed Pillar of Defense. Oh, I suppose it sounds less alarming. Uh, defense uh, is a good thing, isn't it? Um, attacking people behind a cloud perhaps maybe isn't. Uh, evoking memories of Old Testament violence raises questions, uh, perhaps, in the broader world. Um, so this is a sort of typical uh, example of what the Israelis call hasbara, which is control of narrative uh, and propaganda. Due to pressure of what you've called the Israeli lobby in the United States, you've precised later on that it's actually more correct to call it the Likud lobby or the lobby of the right wing in Israel. What exactly do you mean by that definition? Well, I think um, if you look at the American Jewish community, which, from which the activists in the Israel lobby are drawn, there is a large passive support for Israel among Christian fundamentalists, but they are not active, generally speaking. The activists come from a very limited segment, about 4% of the American Jewish community, and these are people who are strong supporters of the extreme right wing in Israel. There's another very interesting instance that you describe. I'm going to read out a quote of yours. Um, you were being told by a senior Israeli official, thank you for what you did for Israel. What job in President Bush's administration do you want? How exactly does that work? I mean, can a foreign power actually influence staffing of national security positions in the US government? Well, when this man, who I had considered a friend and rather admired, tactlessly made that offer to me. Uh, I thought he could deliver it. I thought he was making a real offer, and I was enraged. Uh, as somebody, as an American patriot, I don't like the idea that any foreign country, even one close to us, uh, should be able to dictate our decisions about our internal politics. Was it a bluff, or could he really deliver it? I think it? he might have been able to deliver it. I didn't take him up on it for obvious reasons. I thought it was a despicable But that's kind offer. of scary. It is a little scary, yes. Um, but you see, um, there is, a nar again, a narrative, which is that Israeli interests and American interests are identical. Israeli values and American values are identical. Neither is true if you examine it. But then uh, Israeli narrative would be nothing without American backing. Yes, America is a wonderful echo chamber for Israel. Uh, because our relations are so intimate, uh, we are um, 
so much in contact with each other and the American media are so uh, amenable to spreading uh, the Israeli line, the narrative, um, and the American media are enormously in influential internationally and so this takes what might be a rather small voice from Israel and magnifies, well I don't think there is an Arab lobby, I think it is a fiction of the Israel lobby's imagination or perhaps a sort of construct they have created because you need to have an enemy. So why isn't there an Arab lobby? Well, there's lots of reasons for that. We have a significant Arab American population which potentially could uh, produce a lobby, but it's divided as the Arabs themselves are. So there's no domestic base that could focus the energy of this voting bloc in one direction. And second, uh, turning to the Arab states, uh, yes, the, the Gulf Arabs have plenty of money, but they also have no understanding of the importance of institutions as opposed to people. Their own politics is very personalized. Their own societies don't, in many cases, rest on institutional foundations. Um, they don't have a habit of sustained effort on anything. They are more likely to do something short term. They like the sprint rather than the marathon that is required in this arena. Um, and probably many of them consider it improper uh, to, in effect, buy votes. Um, and uh, I happen to agree with them, uh, but um, uh, they are behind the times, unfortunately. Uh, everyone else is doing it. So you don't have the domestic uh, base and you don't have the foreign support. And I might say that the Gulf Arabs, like other Arabs, they don't like the Arab Americans who are not mainly from the Gulf. The Gulf Arabs don't emigrate. There are no Saudi Americans to speak of. There are no uh, Qatari Americans to speak of. There are no Emirati Americans to speak of. Well, they come to study in states and then go back they to They come and study and they maybe have a vacation home and they uh, enjoy the United States as a visitor, but they don't emigrate. The rights organization says an Israeli airstrike targeted a home in Gaza, killing 12 Palestinians, including women and children. It says Israeli forces dropped a large bomb on the building. The attack was the deadliest during the war that ended. Fear, what's going to make this uh, condemnation different from Human Rights Watch? 2008, Operation Cast Lead, the UN followed that up with uh, this investigation. It actually came out and said that Israel committed war crimes, but really nothing occurred. Well, indeed, that is a, a, an accurate and cynical uh, reading of what happened. I hope, and I'm sure the Palestinian people also hope, uh, and those that support the Palestinian people's enshrined in law human rights, that things will be different this time around, that there will be an improvement of some sort, albeit marginally, that there is a swelling uh, support for Palestinians internationally, um, there is a growing international solidarity movement, as well as most of the world supporting the Palestinian people's rights now and historically at the United Nations. So I think the hope here is that the pressure that is being uh, exacted on Israel, which is increasing over time, will make some difference in, in this case, getting some justice um, in, in these cases that you refer to of the al Dalu family massacre in which four children were killed, or the targeting of journalists. We saw three journalists deliberately assassinated. We saw suspicious weapons during the eight-day assault. And also, Israel actually just broke the ceasefire as well. So really, you can choose, uh, go around the Gaza Strip to any uh, town in Gaza, and you can find um, numerous cases that you could take to the International Criminal Court if you're an investigator. We just hope that they come quickly. And quickly, if you can, uh, upgraded status of Palestine at the UN. Uh, do you think there's uh, going to be a decision made by perhaps the PA uh, to take uh, Israel to the ICC? Uh, yes, this is obviously within the Palestinian will and in the Palestinian interest to escalate um, particular cases, for example, the potential assassination of Yasser Arafat um, and take that to the, to the ICC. Um, we're yet to see whether or not any um, pressure um, is applied on the PA to stop them from doing that, be it from Israel or be it from the United States. Thank you very much there. Harry Fear there uh, talking to us from Gaza.